choppy there, Ed. Right. Yep. Okay, okay, just clicking on that. Hi folks, so we're just joining us, as you probably already aware, it takes a couple of minutes to for me to get everything sorted um, on social media, so bear with us here. So Rog, where are we speaking uh, to you from? Where are you at, at the, the currently? Yeah, well, so I'm out in the Middle East. Um, it's definitely a wee bitty warmer than back there in the UK, I imagine, it's um, <laughs> popping out. Uh, in fact, I think it hit the 50 degrees today, so wow. so yeah, definitely more than this Scottish skin skin can handle, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think it's been about uh, a year since we actually spoke, so what's, I mean, I'm probably guessing there's been a lot going on your end, so maybe you can just inform us what's been happening, you know, over the last year. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, as we've all been battling through this uh, this crazy world and this crazy pandemic, and you know, settling into what has actually been a lot of uh, Skype calls, you know, with work or, you know, personal lives and getting used to that. But, but you know what, what else happened? And what if, uh, if any of you are following me on my social media and, you know, thanks for supporting me as always, Mike, it's a um, great, great to have your support. And, um, but what happened was at the beginning of the pandemic. So this must've been what, say, it was April last year, and um, as we were getting more and more locked down, we got locked down into the villas. It's so where we're living here on a on a compound in the Middle East and outside Arabia, and um, we weren't really allowed to go outside unless we do some exercise. So I went, oh well, you know what? I'll, I'll get into a bit of indoor cycling and and do a bit of that. So I managed to sign up to Swift, and I've always been a bit of a cycling geek, so um, I got really really into that. But then I got a bit bored. I was like, I really need to get out of the house. You know, I need to get out and do something as we've all, you know, experienced. So, so I went. You know what? I can. I'm not allowed to leave the compound, but I can go for a run around the compound. But because of my injury, as you know, I've got nine pins and a titanium plate in my left leg, and the titanium plate is about half a length of my shin. So, wow. Wow. I've obviously because of the accident, I have really stayed away from running for what I worked out is about 15, 16 years. So I, I ran a five, and I've done a little bit here and there, but I, I ran a 5K around the compound. I went, oh, that's okay. I ran another 5K, ran a 10K, and then I went, you know what? I think I can actually do a bit more. And I've always been keen on the endurance events, especially on the bike. Um, and I've always been a keen swimmer. As I was in the RAF swimming team back in the day. Um, so I thought, actually, I've always wanted to do an Ironman. And I remember actually telling my mum that as well, my aspiration. And you know, and the, there's there's a lot more sort of reasons behind it. But um, like I, I love this um, quote I wrote down is, is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I tell you, I, I yeah. know that from the joint sport. But then you know, when you branch it across into mental health, actually, you know, those uncomfortable conversations they need to become comfortable. That's the way I think of it. So we're normalising. You know when we're talking about mental health and whatnot so anyway long story short i went right there and then okay i'm going to train for an ironman and i'm going to go for it the, the the longest i have done a triathlon before but as a sprint triathlon um you know years ago um so this is quite a step up to the 3.8 kilometer swim 180 kilometer bike and then a marathon so it's uh, it's going to be a fair challenge and that's what i'm aiming for on the 7th of august and you'll see you know, plenty, far too much lycra on social media. I can only apologize. <laughs> uh, but, but we've we've raised about we raised about six hundred quid uh, for mental health uh, for Mind, sorry, um, for the mental health charity Mind. So uh, that's a great start already, and I've still got four weeks to go. So no backing out now. So a good uh, good way of accountability. But um, but anyway, yeah, that's my that's my latest um, let's call it <clears throat> craze. Or project, or venture, or my my fundraising campaign for this year, because you know, as you know, I do a lot of fundraising, so I kind of want to space it out for people. I don't want to keep asking 
uh, money from people uh, all the time. So I've uh, I've kind of held off this year, and this is my my go-to. <laughs> so so yeah, and uh, just I see some questions coming on. Um, hi James, hi Bill, and uh, I'll, I'll get to your questions in a minute. And hi Jude as well. Um, uh, great great to see you tuning in. So yeah, great guys, get your questions coming in. But really, Rod, just give us a. Um, I mean, everyone probably knows you by now, but uh, you've got a, you've had a fantastic REF career. Could you just give us a you know maybe a minute or two just to get um, get the background out there so the questions can come in. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess to start off with, I actually was a skier back in the day, um, and I, I joined up. Um, I got, I got pretty good in, in ski racing and got into the British team, but at the same time I was, or my parents were running out of money and nearly went bankrupt trying to support me skiing. So I had to get out of that and um, I'd always wanted to be a pilot. Um, um, you know, ever since, to be honest, I had a dream and I think it's actually in a newspaper article when I was 10 years old that I, I said I wanted to go to the Olympics and I wanted to fly um, Typhoon. <laughs> so. Um, I was, um, I definitely had some clear focus back then, even at 10 years old. Um, but luckily, uh, well, you know, it was bad luck with the running out of money in, in, for the sports because I was obsessed with ski racing or skiing. Um, but then I was so lucky to get a position to get into the Air Force. So I started and, and joined the Air Force 2001. And, and then from that point on, um, I was supposed to go into flying training, but the RAF did an amazing thing and gave me a sabbatical um, where I could follow the, the British ski team program until the Olympics. And with, um, with funding and, and, well, to be honest, the fact that I could just ski and follow the full-time program. Uh, so that was an amazing opportunity um, and then got through that and, um, yeah, had this crash that I told you about actually 10 months before the Olympics. Ended up with a lot of metal work in my leg, but managed to, to get back on skis, which was, um, as some people said, you know, including the surgeon, including the team doctor, that it was a bit of a miracle, or was a miracle. Um, go back on skis and um, managed to re-qualify for the Olympics, and I did the Olympics in 2006. Uh, and then from there, it was pretty crazy, uh, hanging up my ski boots and retiring from the sport um, at the age of 23. But then, again, so fortunate because I was able to go straight into the flying training. So, so full time um, and just head first into the flying. So then my career um, started off the, the standard way with elementary flying training on the, on the mighty Grob Tutor. It was good fun throwing that thing around. Um, <laughs> and then onto the Takano, the turbo prop. Although that is, as you probably know, if you've been following a stand now. So, um, and that was at Linton on Ooze. Um, and then I went to, uh, luckily got my wings and qualified to continue on to the Hawk T1. So I was uh, on two weight squadron at RAF Valley. And then even though I'd struggled a lot um, through Linton on Ooze on the Takano, um, I, I, I got through that course, but then I seemed to get the hang of things and I seemed to just um, enjoy and get on well with the Hawk and with jets, so um, they actually, at the end of the course, asked me to stay on as an instructor, so a creamy, uh, as they as they call it. So a young instructor that you know they they have you there so that you can relate to the younger uh, guys and girls coming through the course, instead of the the old knackered um, fighter pilots who are off the front line and bitter. Uh, only joking. Um, um, so it was yeah, it was, that was an amazing experience. Five years at RAF Valley. Uh, and then managed to get through weapons training, which was like the next phase of the, um, well, the, the training really, uh, the weapons training at Valley. And then from there, I streamed on to the, the mighty typhoon, which, um, you know, as I said, was always my dream to fly. And then I did two tours um, at, um, well, it started off at RAF Lucas and then on six Squadron, moved up to RAF Lossiemouth. And then from there, um, I actually got posted then to Coningsby, and then about uh, a week later, found out that I'd been promoted to squadron leader and then sent back up to Lossiemouth onto two squadron as a flight commander on two squadron, which it was my last tour before coming out here. So, so yeah, it's been, um, I've been really, really so fortunate and I'm, you know, really grateful for one, the teams I had around me and everything I've done with the skiing and the flying. Uh, but I just feel really lucky in my typhoon career because of the, the timing that I had 
it meant that I arrived when everything was kicking off. You know, so there was lots to do so many exercises and then Operation Shader as well, which kept us as a force really busy and still very busy. Um, and then, you know, some, well, some, well, really, let's call it really interesting experiences on Operation Shader, some things that I'll never forget as well as, you know, a lot of the other exercises as well and, you know, air to air exercises and deployments. So, yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate and, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to write, you know, everything down as well. So don't forget it as I get further away. You know, I might still go back to the typhoon. Who knows? I'm kind of going with the flow. But, um, but yeah, that's um, that's my sort of life, I guess, in as quick as I can make it. <laughs> well, brilliant. I mean, yeah, a very enviable career, that's for sure, Rog. But as you can see, there's some questions coming inside. So if you want to just get to the top there, Rog, and wake your way down, that'd be great. Yeah, sure, no problem at all. And uh, hello again, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I'll do my best to um, to answer your questions as best I can. If I don't, please just re-attack with another uh, question. Or if I miss a question, please do not be afraid to just throw it in again. But hopefully, I'll, uh, I'll get through them as best I can. So, Bill, could the Typhoon ever have flown from or been adopted to fly effectively from an aircraft carrier? You know what? That is a good question. And if you if we think of it... As a, um, as they refer to it, the specific excess powers SEP, um, the Typhoon has plenty, and it's one of the most, looking at the power to weight ratio, one of the most powerful aircraft out there. So to be honest, when you when you look at it that way, that's a really important thing. So simply the. Um, you know, the, the trap on the aircraft carrier and obviously the launch as well and adapting the aircraft to that. Um, however, you can imagine when it comes to industry and the resource and, and things behind it to be able to do that, that would be a, a big, a momentous task. So it was really, you know, never designed uh, for that. And I think it would have um, it would have needed with the whole core nations and, and all the countries involved in Typhoon, it would have needed a lot of different backing um, for them to actually go ahead because it, it, it couldn't just be, oh, the RAF wants this um, and the RAF would be able to, you know, to back the funding. It, it just wouldn't have enough money for that. Um, so, it, you know, in my opinion, I don't know that for sure, but to be honest, it's um, it would have to be something that was was bought into by a lot of the core nations. I hope that answers your question. Um, but yeah, absolutely. When it comes to the you know the avionics and the the power, then it's it's got plenty, so it would be absolutely fine. Um, oh yeah, dude. Okay, so um, well, obviously, hello again. And the story behind the photo where I look like I'm being held at gunpoint. Yeah, so I put that on. Um, on my Instagram, Speed of Sound, Sound of Mind, <laughs> just because I was just thinking about, uh, I've been chatting to Mike and thinking about what would, um, you know, be a, kind of a funny photo, especially when you look closely and I'm in my dodgy white long johns uh, that are, that's under my uh, flying suit, bearing in mind that it's like 40 degrees there. Um, um, and obviously we wear those because of fire risk and, and things like that. So, but that um, story was when I was on two squadron, I was um, flying as part of um, exercise of safe Saria in Oman in Thumrate, uh, based out of Thumrate, which is kind of more towards the, the south of Oman, uh, the southwest of Oman. And um, as part of the exercise, what I had been, had been planted uh, something where at the end of the exercise we were doing a big air-to-air -air simulated war and then I was to break away and then squawk some code and uh, talk in a funny accent. I think I sounded like a Scottish Arab uh, that was from Romania. Uh, I think someone uh, said, which you can imagine, um, it, it wasn't, yeah, it was interesting and no offence to anybody who's actually uh, from there. Um, so uh, at the um, at the end of the exercise, I broke off as a single singleton, as a single typhoon on my own, which kind of confused a few people. But at the same time, there was a couple of people in the formation who knew what was going on to, you know, avoid any safety risks. And at the same time, I was making all the correct radio calls um, to the the right agencies like command and control and tower uh, to actually land. But at the but then conversely, I was 
pretending to be this um, this crazy accent on on the back box or on the company frequency, which was also dialed into what was going on, which was like a a full scale simulated war um, practice. Let's call it that for the deployment. So for the entire deployment, you know. So quite often on these exercises, it's, it's all there to support the the flying. But this was all about like, well, what happens if you get attacked um, on the ground? You know, you have to protect the base. So therefore, QRFs or quick reaction forces, having them on alert. And then what about if there's um, CBRN, you know, a, um, a threat, a chemical warfare threat? How are you going to react to that? So in this instance, um, and the reason for the photo, and of course, people were taking it because it was quite funny that there were um, that, well, how it played out was that I was making all these radio calls and then came in um, to the circuit and, and landed. And then I was um, telling them that, that I was a defector from the made up country that was part of this practice, uh, this simulated war. Um, and But of course, because I was a defector, they then had to practice the procedure of how they would actually deal with a, a real life defector. Um, and you know, there's plenty of manhandling, they're not going to take any risks. So it was a case of as soon as I got out the aircraft, and I think the way until it was about 20 steps away from the aircraft, just to not to get involved in or in the way of shutting down the aircraft and all the, you know, important uh, processes behind that. They then quickly uh, grabbed me, cuffed me, were stripping me and the, the plaster cuffs. <laughs> and um, it was at one point I was just like, how far are you going to take this? Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was one thing. It was, and um, it certainly got a, a good laugh out of all the, the all my flight lieutenants on the squadron, squadron as well. So, um, NGM, how do you see the future of the typhoon with stealth? being everywhere these days? That's a really good question. And actually, it's one that is, it, you need to think of it as, as um, a bit of a, a chess game. It, and you've got, you know, out the front, you're always gonna have the pawns. So when you look at it on the big scale, even though the typhoon is epic, and you refer, people refer to it as a 4.5 generation fighter, Still, of course, with the nature of fifth and sixth gen and that becoming more prolific, and then don't forget the swarming drone technology and, and things like that as they start to become, well, they're already prolific, but how that then weaves into the battle space, then actually it's going to be it's going to be an interesting dynamic. But you're always going to have to have those pawns. So it's actually about, and I've already experienced this, um, for example, as part of Excise Red Flag, where we were operating very closely with um, the Raptors, so the F-22s, and um, we would be on the leading edge, so on the front, maybe a like an eight ship, on all on a on a um, yeah front edge, and in wall, which is where you're in a certain formation, and you're trying to just cover and dominate that airspace. But at the same time, there was other um, stealth assets out there that we didn't have situational awareness of. Or maybe you know, I won't say too much, but weren't fully aware of, and then having, but the F-22 obviously had full awareness. So then the F-22 would liaise with us. Now take that into this day and age with the F-35 as a UK F-35 or coalition F-35. Now I heard that the last uh, red flag, then actually Typhoon's F-35 were were working together seamlessly. So that's actually where. It, it, it comes into play. It's like, yes, Typhoon is not stealth, never will be, but it's a ferocious fighter that will dominate most things in a dogfight. And, and actually with the new um, e-scan radar on the horizon, the, the RAF have actually bought into ECRS Mark II, which is going to be the, the new very sophisticated radar in the future. Then you, you have us, I say us, the Typhoons out the front, but then working with the F-35s, filling in the picture as in providing that situation of awareness. So yeah, it's all about interoperability as well as um, working together as a team. Um, you know, so so you're relying on the Typhoons to do a certain amount, but then actually you you work as a team where you you're able to capitalize on the sensors from the F-35, maybe being fed through Link 16 or, or MIDS 
um, so that you can actually see that essay that he or she has got on the F thirty five provided on, on your displays. So, so yeah, it's all going it's all going to be about um, integration in the future. Hey Nathan, um, thank you very much for tuning in. I'll keep going with the questions. Uh, so, what advice would I give to someone working towards an officer role in the RAF that I wish I had received when I was about to start at Cranwell? Good question. Um, and and actually, I think the most important is I've, I've been asked this a few times, and I've spoken to a few um, you know people who are joining or who are about to join, and the the best bit of advice is it's all about attitude. And because if you are hungry, but but not hungry just to be the best, because that can often come across as arrogant, or maybe you isolate yourself from the group or the team. Um, you've you've got to you've got to want to learn, but you've also got to want to almost make mistakes. You know, avoiding that fear of failure and just throwing yourself in there and going right, I I can I can do this, and then also not trying to shield your mistakes from the team, just actually being very open and honest with each other. And because, you know, even through the selection, OASC, Officer and Air Crew Selection Center at RF Cranwell, where you're even trying to get into the RAF, you know, they're looking for this. They're looking for you as a leader, but actually often a leader has to, it has to demonstrate good followership as well, where they are um, willing to be part of the team and not always be at the front or, or arrogantly trying to lead when actually they need to include the team. So, so I think it's it's all about that. Um, I guess attitude is probably a bit too vague. I think it's that hunger to learn. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to put it. And I, I hope that answers your question. Um, and sorry, MGM. Um, again, hopefully that branches into what I've actually said about the F thirty five. Me um, personally, um, not flown against it. We actually operated out in um, Shader, Operation Shader. So that was on my third uh, tour of Operation Shader based out of Cyprus. And the F-35s were there as well. Um, so that was, that was awesome, actually, to be, to be flying with them um, and actually you know, operating with them out of this at the same Operation Shader. So yeah, but never, never fought against them. I know that's starting to happen a lot more now as they're starting to you know, work on the interoperability and, and working together as a team. Um, but um, by, you know, from a lot of people, it's a really impressive platform. Uh, so Nathan, uh, do I think Typhoon suffers from or might suffer in the future from a lack of terrain following radar? Um, you know what, I think you, you've got to look at what the Typhoon is primarily or mostly going to be used for. And, and as an air to air, uh, fighter, I mean, well, to be honest, you can, you can almost step away from that because although it is primarily an air to air fighter, the thing is, um, it is a full up multi-role beast now, you know, it's got so many different, it's got a suite of different weapons. And it can do a multitude of different disciplines because it's very capable. You know, when I started flying it um, back in 2013, it wasn't really that capable in the air to ground environment. But of course, as you can imagine, now with um, Operation Shader, I mean, it was always that was always the plan was to bring it more into the air to ground environment. But as it then took over and I was actually there as it took over from the Tornado GR4 on Operation Shader, then it, you, and even obviously before that, it just it's just come into its own with the with the helmet, the HMSS the striker, you know the the ability to have all that information on your uh, visor when you say track and moving target, you can just look outside, you can see a big green triangle over it, you know things like that and how it all links into the the system, the camera, the weapons, um, and that is only getting better as the air force looks to hone that, and or not just the RAF but the different core nations look to hone that. Um, but so boiling that down to the terrain falling radar, well, you know, when it comes to low level flying, say at night, which is probably where you want, you know, that uh, the most, that capability the most, then there's not many times where we're going to employ that tactic. Uh, and that is because of the nature uh, of the increasing technology when it comes to surface to air missile threats, 
um, you know, are you actually ever going to be able to get underneath the the radars uh, these days? Um, you know, and think of it as and not just from you know who were fighting, what they have, but also offboard sensors and um, you know the 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 picture coming from elsewhere, not just the surface to air missile uh, threat. So um, that means that actually. Um, would we em employ that? And if we would, we'd probably go down to a certain point, like for doing quick reaction alerts, you know, of course, there's the potential to have a low and slow threat, you know, uh, an aircraft that is um, that is posing um, a threat and, and we have to react to that as quick as possible. And if it's low and slow, then we have to be able to deal with it. And actually, as you as, as you probably know, I can tell from the question, that for a radar to look to to look down, every radar's performance is going to be degraded because of look down because of the ground clutter uh, that's being reflected back to and having to um, delineate uh, across that and figure out what the actual target is and where it is. So yeah, I mean, it, again, it's um, it's a capability that I certainly think that the typhoon is missing that it would. It would be better with, but then there's quite a lot of different capabilities. So I think that one has just fallen, you know, off the off the list. It's just too 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 low down in the priorities. But yeah, great question. Uh, right. So Timberwolf. Oh, so have I had any strange sightings? Um, you know what? I haven't. Um, and it is interesting that there are uh, some being investigated by U.S. Congress, and um, you know, who's to say yes or no? Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but when it comes to myself and my colleagues, we I haven't no I haven't seen anything. Um, and yeah, and I th but I think my opinion on the subject is that yeah, the, the I don't see why there wouldn't be. I guess is the way to look at it. Um, so it'll be yeah, be interesting to see if there's any findings that come out of that. Uh, Jude, um, what I think will be the most difficult part of the Ironman challenge? <laughs> um, well, from because I've actually, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, I've been training for about a year and a quarter now, and I find that actually I feel quite strong um, in my head. You know, so when and you, you know, you were kindly supporting me when I did the, the for example, the first indoor cycling challenge where I was riding from seven o'clock at night um, on the indoor trainer and didn't stop until seven in the morning at um, twelve hours. And I and I think that's what actually attracted me to the Ironman challenge as well is because I realised that oh I, I can actually push myself through these barriers through these challenges and. And and actually, um, when it comes to the, the specific sports, swimming, cycling, and running, then I really enjoy those as well. Not so much running, but then I've actually found myself getting into running. But to answer your question is, um, yeah, the the most difficult part would certainly be the Ironman because I mean I've only the only distance I've ever raced in running is is a is a ten k. So this is quite a step up to, to run a marathon at the end of a 3.8k swim and 180k bike. But um, but like I said, I'm really looking forward to it. And you know, I must admit that it's 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 one thing as well that I was you know wanting to sort of bring out in this is that I think it's really important that one thing that I'm really uh, looking forward to the challenge of the Ironman and what you'll see come out of me on, on social media is that you know you don't have to accept what people state as an outcome for you so what I mean by that is like say to bring it back an example is when I was younger and I had lots of my uh, peers tell me my coaches tell me even parents of other kids tell me that I would never make it in ski racing because I was too skinny and I was really skinny um, you know, I weighed nothing and like wearing a cat suit, which is supposed to be, you know, lycra and tight fitting of just flapping in the wind. Um, um, but at the time, you know, that it, it was always brutal to hear that because I was so passionate and I wanted, I absolutely wanted to get to Olympics. It was my ultimate aim. Um, and that was, I was living and breathing skiing. Um, so, 
actually as I as I push, 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 and then I end up getting up to 96 kilograms. And you know, I'm I'm 80 now as I've been training for this Ironman. I've had to lose weight for the Ironman, which is a bit strange. But you know, I, I got um, as big as I ever would have got, and which was much better for a downhill skier. Whereas, in you know, a lot of people said just didn't think that would ever happen. And 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 then also with the flying, like I, it was actually self-induced. Where I was always telling myself that I would never be good enough to be a pilot. I was always so scared of of actually going for it and trying to to be a pilot. Um, or you know, trying to go into the selection and everything. So, yeah, that was that was definitely something that I had to just take the plunge, and it took a lot of convincing by people close to me to to actually uh, make me go for it. And um, and then also, but yeah, and the big one when it relates to the Ironman is the fact that you know my when I had the operation back in 2005. Um, uh, the surgeon went in for an arthroscopy. So he said, oh, I'm just going to go and have a look around because we can't figure out what's actually going on with your legs. We need to do an arthroscopy so we can actually go and have a look. And if I see anything and I have to operate, then I'll operate straight away. But, you know, I'm sure that won't happen. And then I woke up, you know, the next morning after being out cold and general anesthetic for about three hours, I think. Um, it was like, you know, the, the maximum time they could uh, keep me under and I woke up in a, a morphine thinking I was inside the TV and then starting to ask the questions of uh, you know what was actually going on and I remember when the surgeon broke the news to me to say that I've, I've put nine pins in a plate in your leg and I uh, you know I hate to be the one to tell you but you'll never be able to ski again you'll probably always walk with a limp you'll never be able to run again and you'll have full-blown arthritis after 10 years and you know, I've I've broken most bones in my body from well, mostly from skiing. Um, but he was he was not budging. He was not backing down with his statement. And I was saying, well, what, surely if I do this, surely if I do this. And um, but you know, in my head, I was like, no, I I know someone. I know a couple of people who have had a similar injury and they've gone on to be successful. So I am going to push. I've got nothing else in my world right now apart from trying to get back on skis and requalify for the Olympics. So I think. Um, you know, when it comes to the Ironman Challenge, this is like, you know, this is my two fingers up to, not to the, not really to the surgeon, because he's a really awesome guy, um, is an awesome guy. And, you know, all, all the people who, who doubted me were just trying to give me that medical uh, opinion or, or statement of what was going to happen. Um, but, you know, here I am, and, and I've already run 30 kilometers on the treadmill just the other weekend, and actually, my leg is doing all right, so hopefully it'll um, it'll survive. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that's a bit of a long-winded answer. So um, right on to the next one. Oh, I've just scrolled down. Sorry, bear with me. Oh, cool. There's lots of questions. Right, I better crack on. Um, so did I? I did play Eurofighter 2000 back in the day, and actually, Vish, that was one of the the um, the games that properly got me hooked and, and cemented that ambition. So yeah, I, I loved it. I, I really did. And see, I was of the, the age, or I, I guess you could say I was old enough when the internet or computers became a thing, you know, the good old spectrum, playing playing games and that, and then getting better and better computers. And then as uh, the internet came in, and then my uh, my friend was way better in computers than I was, and and knew about this stuff. He introduced me to internet gaming, and then I chat to him, or he he mentioned something to do with flight simulation, and that's actually what got me into it. And I think ES two thousand was um, back then was a really good game for for a flight simulation. Actually, you know, one v one dogfighting over the internet, and that was me. I was hooked. So actually, yeah, computer games is is what got me into this job, or it certainly helped. I think so. It helped with the passion, and probably it helped with the eye hand coordination as well. Uh, MGM. So how is it being a fire pilot with such an injury? Any special needs equipment in the cockpit? No, well, uh, luckily, no, um, because, but it, it, it was very, a really interesting time and obviously full of uncertainty because at that point, when I had broken my leg, I had, I mean, I, I'd been to get into the Air Force um, and to be a pilot, then obviously you need to go through the whole medical suitability process and testing at OASC. Um, but this, of course, came at a point where I'd been in the Air Force for 
what was about four years um, and now I completely lost my medical category to be a pilot um, but I'd never been a pilot before so you're in that dangerous place where if you if you don't have the category medical category to even start flying then there's a danger that they wouldn't even accept you into the into the role so um but luckily because of the way it happened i did a lot of my rehabilitation through the british ski team and the RAF were amazing in, in letting me do that because there was a, a very a streamlined process of physiotherapy and, and team doctors who are really, really fortunate to be part of and, and be embedded in that. And and really that's probably what helped me make such a quick recovery and get back onto skis. Um, so because of the fact that I'd actually competed in the Olympics, I remember having a conversation with the RAF doctor where it was a case of, he asked me, well, can you squat? You know, can you can you do a lunge for me? And I did have to do that in the in the room <laughs> as a bit of an assessment. And you know, I, I had nothing to hide and could easily do a squat at that point. I would have hoped so. Um, so instantly, just like, yeah, I see no reason why not to let you carry on. Um, but then, as if if you um, don't know my story, actually, then after EFT, so elementary flying training on the Grob Tutor. At that point, I actually went on a, on a wee holiday out to Lake Tahoe in America and uh, I crashed on a mountain bike. Oh, in short, in set, I should rephrase that actually. The mountain bike fell apart from underneath me, at honest, where the front suspension forks came apart and I just dove, or as in the, 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 the wheel can attached to the bottom half of the forks continued on and then I just went in like a pitchfork. So I don't know I remember anything about it apart from briefly waking up after being a cold for minutes and then got airlifted to the local hospital which is actually in a different state in um, in Nevada so it was Reno hospital and they um, had to operate um, straight away on my face so I woke up not being able to breathe absolutely so scared because I couldn't breathe so I had to be writing things down. They were giving me anxiety pills to, to help with everything that was going on. But they ended up putting four metal coils in my face, which is still there today. So hence, um, uh, for the for my fundraising campaign, I'm, I'm calling the, myself the Scottish Titanium Man. So um, yeah, so ho hopefully I'll, <laughs> I'll manage to actually finish the Ironman as a Scottish Titanium Man. Um, so yeah, but luckily, and then after that, I, after the four metal coils in my face, I mean, I was on soft foods for about three months and, um, but eventually I just stuck to what the doctors and dentists were saying. And eventually after they took the metal brace out of my mouth, off, off my gums, which was literally a dentist and the assistants having to hold me back and he had his foot on my shoulder to rip this metal work off my gums um because it'd been on there for three months or so the reason being at night i would have to string elastic bands between the two bits of the, uh, the the brace to actually keep my jaw shut so yeah really interesting time in my life especially after being so close to injuring myself what was only a year prior um but again i stuck to the guidance and very fortunately got my medical category back uh, after, I had to do some pretty extensive testing on that, some cameras on the end of tubes going into my face to look around my sinuses. But they found out that actually I was, um, my sinuses were maybe even better than they were before, uh, just the way my face had grown, grown back because I'd, I'd snapped my face across here, snapped my clean break of the nose, luckily it was nice and clean, and then I'd ripped my face apart there. So hence I got some here to, to hide that, although it's not too obvious, luckily. Um, luckily kept on my teeth, but they had to use the four mental coils to to get my, to really put my face back in position again. So yes, very lucky to again, get my uh, medical category back. And uh, so did I ever think of, um, if, I, if I wouldn't make the grade and not fly a typhoon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because the, 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 the truth was that it's um, a pretty, it's, it's a very difficult process. And I think going back, right back to answering I think James's question, it was like, I always had that hunger to learn because I, I, I learned that uh, from being in the skiing, you know, because 
you can't have just constantly the coach tell you, oh, you're, that's wrong. You need to do this. You need to do this. Uh, um, you'll only be better if you do this. You, you need to know it and want and be hungry for it yourself. So therefore, you're constantly self-evaluating and, and trying to and self-debriefing to try and be the best version of yourself. And, you know, luckily I took that in flying training because trust me, there was some serious, you know, low points where I actually failed my BHT, so my basic handling test on BFJT, which was basic fast jet training. Uh, so that was on the Takano at Linton News. And I, I failed that twice in a row and then ha had to do my chop ride, as they called it, with the chief instructor. And even though my grades had been really good before that, and I, I just took a, as what would probably be known as a case of testitis, where I was just, I got myself into a spiral of self-doubt, uh, a downward spiral, and had to get myself back out of that, and I had to believe in myself. And, and actually, the chief instructor, he was a great guy who really who gave me that belief and said, look, I've seen your grades. I'm not going to fail you. I just want you to perform. So let's go on out and have some fun. And that's how he framed it. And even though I know he would have chopped me if I didn't, if I wasn't up to the mark, um, I had a great flight. Um, so, so, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. I had, there was, there's plenty of self doubt and that's probably one of my biggest problems, uh, issues as, um, as a younger person and, and especially going through flying training, never mind skiing, it's exactly the same skiing, but going through flying training, you know, you, you end up almost like competing against people around you. Um, it's, it's a pretty ruthless, you know, you, you work as a team for some aspects, but at the same time, you're all almost always competing for a spot. Um, so yeah, it was, um, yeah, I had, I had to give my wits about me and just be hungry to learn and just simply try to do my best and, and never give up. <laughs> I was, uh, it was always, you know, what my dad told me and, um, and how he brought me up. So it was really important that I kept, I just kept on trucking. Uh, so Typhoon EW capability, please explain. Um, <laughs> you've got some, you got some, uh, interesting questions on here um i definitely can't disclose the range of meteor i'm sure there's something out there on open source uh, which you can uh, google uh, when it comes to the ew capability uh i mean all i can say is that the typhoon has a very sophisticated um das which is a defensive aid subsystem suite um which is listening for other radar en energy so listening for rf radio radio frequency and and how that is is coming in and it can delineate um yeah i'll probably stop there but it's um it's very sophisticated and um yeah i'll uh, i'll be dodging any more classified questions but but um but yeah thank honestly honestly thanks for tuning in i just i need to be very careful because if i want to continue doing this and for Mike to do his fantastic work, we definitely cannot be uh, answering some of these questions. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, Figma 42, Typhoon coupling with the F-35 in years to come. Yeah, I've hopefully alluded to some of that if you tuned in before, um, where the interoperability, um, you know, Link 16, um, and how actually they can potentially send if they've got a target on their radar, it's instantly going to pop up on the Typhoon radar, even if the Typhoon doesn't have it. Um, and, you know, that already works uh, amongst the, the Typhoon community, the Typhoon force, um, using Link 16, where you've got maybe, say, four Typhoons hot, as in they're hot to the threat, and then four Typhoons going cold, then you're going to have that contact from the hot fighters populating on the cold fighters um, mids display. Hopefully that makes sense, but that's how you can work as a team. So then if you think, if you expand that into the F-35 and using different capabilities with Link 16, which is like passing met coded messages, encrypted messages, um, well, effectively you could say it's all encrypted. So that's, that's how you end up working as a team. Um, because like I said, with the sensors on the F-35 as, you know, a fifth gen fighter, it's, it's, um, certainly in that aspect, much more, uh, um, supreme than the, than the Typhoon. Um, Arjun, when it comes to Rafale versus Eurofighter, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely uh, pros and cons to both aircraft, but when you compare the two, 
uh, the the typhoon, in my opinion, definitely comes up trumps, um, it, you know, in a, in a lot of different aspects. So, um, and I've actually, you know, I've had the the um, some some great uh, flights actually against the. Uh, I'm just referring to my notes. It was it was actually, I won't say where, but we operated with uh, some Rafales from who were flying um, or launching off the Charles de Gaulle, so the French aircraft carrier. And, um, and I organized um, like a force integration mission and it was with two Rafales. Um, so two Rafales, two of us, including me leading that formation. And then we were um, fighting against, so two simulated enemy aircraft, so the two other Rafales. Um, and we were using um, command and control from a Type 45 destroyer, HMS Duncan, um, and yeah, it was, it was just it was just awesome. It was an absolute amazing experience, you know, all of us working together as a team, um, thinking of it that way, and then all of us actually air uh, air to air refueling with the Voyager afterwards. Um, so to see all six aircraft on the wing of the Voyager uh, was was yeah, it was quite a spectacle. So you know, very lucky to be part of that. Really awesome. Hey, uh, Jonathan, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. So applying to the RAF when applications reopen and Royal Navy yourself, you was wondering what kind of stuff I got up to when not flying in work. What responsibilities did you have? Um, so, okay, I got you. So you're just um, yeah, wondering. Yeah, so for, for me, um, I was in the, in the gap where I was and do my skiing, like I said, really um, such a um, such a lucky place to be in and to have the support of the organization. Um, and during that point, I was doing things like organizing uh, RAF Lucas air show. So I was organizing the aircraft uh, and the air crew, like all that logistics. So actually quite a big job, but really satisfying, especially when it came to the um, to the the air show itself and the after party, um, you know, it was it was just amazing to be part of that. Especially at that point, as a budding uh, pilot who had never flown anything, I could just constantly, you know, ask people and and get that information. Uh, you know, just just as I said, I'm so hungry to be a pilot. So, um, so yeah, that's what I, I got up to mainly. And and actually, it was um, the couple of other jobs I had was the flight safety officer, which was a lot of spreadsheet management just because of the role that I was in but actually there were aspects of it that was really interesting and you know really insightful to what was to come you know just just almost knowing you're learning about bird strikes and, and things like that where you don't realize how big a thing that is and um, well until you're a part of one and I've had a couple of interesting um, issue or bird strikes myself um, and then the other one was I was an ops officer as helping out on Treble One Squadron back in the day up at RAF Lucas, uh, which was the Tornado F3 uh, Frontline Squadron, and um, and that was a great, uh, just such a good experience once again because I was a budding pilot. You know, I was going around in a flying suit, but I never actually flown, and I, I got abuse from plenty of people for that. But um, you know, I was part of the squadron, and I was I was there. Everyone knew that I was. Um, Going to do my best to get into flying, but you know, I never even knew I'd make it, so I was I was soaking it all up. So, hopefully that um, answers your question. Um, but I definitely think if I were you, um, you know, if if this is what I read from your question, if you're trying to get experience and do try and get um, onto a frontline squadron, you know, go to Marum for example, F thirty five, and and just go and see what they do, be part of it because you just you absorb so much, and you know, just that. That lingo as well, learning the language of um, of what fighter pilots are talking about. Because trust me, it's a different language where you just don't have a clue until you're then embedded in it. And then obviously that's the language that you speak. And then as I've discovered into this job, it's then like the, the sort of corporate and industry speak that is like another language that I've... I thought I knew everything about Typhoon and then I, I'm like writing down all the different acronyms trying to figure everything out. Uh, but hopefully that answers your question. And so next one. How will life post typhoon ever compare now? Do you still enjoy flying? I absolutely love flying, and I will always love flying. So I think you actually—I was discussing this with a friend of mine, another um, fighter pilot—and you, you do get people who are different kinds of pilot. You get some people who just love flying. You know, it's that the essence of flying. 
the, the freedom of it and the feeling of it as well. And then you get some people who are who enjoy that, you know, being in command of say a force ship and being in charge of the battle space and, and understanding the battle space and 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 to be honest, although I enjoyed that, what I loved and I've always loved is is the pure essence of flying. And I, I guess I compare it to you know driving a fa- fast car and and my ski racing. You know, I love that feeling and I'm always looking for it. And it's it's not as simple as being an adrenaline junkie, although I certainly am. But it's the it's the feeling of it and, and that that flow that you get, you know, when it shuts off everything else because you're just so focused on what you're doing. And yeah, skiing, um, skiing, driving, flying, I definitely get that in. Although, you know, it depends where you're driving. You have to be in the flow of driving out in your Saudi Arabia. Trust me, the roads are crazy. Um, so on to the next one, James Grant. Uh, what does a typhoon do better than a Rafale? What advantages does it have for foreign sales versus Rafale? Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, that is a, a a good question, and I don't really want to answer it because you see that the, the problem is being a fighter pilot, and I'm flying the flag for the typhoon. Then I don't want to provide any sort of connotations of what people can read into. You know, even though this is obviously all my personal opinion, it's still something that you, you know you you want to. Um, you don't want to sort of open the can of worms and attract attention. I mean, one, so I've never fought a Rafale, so I can't really, um, uh, well, like I said, I fought against one, but it was in air to air. We didn't actually end up going into, um, into any ACT or combat training or any dog fighting or anything. Um, but I have fought on the next uh, question. Oh, oh, in fact, sorry, it's gone. Oh, sorry, you just deleted it, but you, you've spoken about the, the gripping and um and yeah with the the gripping i actually did fight against that and you know like one thing i can say about the gripping was that it is i've, I've seen the system the avionics and it's it's you know really impressive as is the Rafale, as is the typhoon but the gripping you know it just it definitely doesn't have the power and the, the specific excess power that talks about this scp you know it doesn't have that power to weight ratio like the typhoon does so it's always going to be you know um at an advantage um, uh, as in typhoon compared to the Gripen. Um, so, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave it there. But but again, thanks for the question. And sorry, I, I uh, I've just got to stay away from stray away from some questions. Um, and Tom, so you've got IoT coming up? Yes, awesome. Um, well, hopefully, again, you uh, you heard what I was saying before. Um, and, and I guess we're talking about more of the application process, and and you know, as you start getting into the um uh well into the into officer training itself it's definitely about being hungry to learn you know because you you get a lot of let's call it peacocking you know as you go through initial officer training where people feel like they have to be someone and actually they stop being themselves but it's it, it's really obvious you know that, they, that they're coming across as being fake so uh, it, it's certainly a case of just being yourself and 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 trying to um to, to be constantly hungry to learn. And if and when, because you will mess up, you will make mistakes, you will fail at something, is to be able to you know bounce back from that and don't let it dissuade you, just learn from that experience. Because you know the fear of failure is a massive thing. But you, in my opinion, we as a human race, um, especially when you know you're you're budding for IoT and you're about to start that, you just got to embrace it in a sense, just flip it on its head. Don't be fearful of it, embrace it, because actually that is the, all the, to, you know, success is an individual thing. So I myself see myself as successful, but that is what, what I deem as a success. Like, you know, just to, just to sort of get that out there. So when it comes to, um, when I look back, how I became successful is from failure. It is from lots of different things, like failing that BHT, the basic handling test, and and crashing multiple times in when I was ski racing, not not flying, fortunately. Um, but then you learn from that as well. You know, look at for example, uh, Perty is a, a mate of mine who was red one last year, uh, well for a couple of years because we were flight commanders together on two squadron, and um, absolute legend. Um, like I said, good friend of mine who is just one of those guys 
who is just willing to go, yeah, I, I made a mistake and I've learned from it. Um, and to be willing to be open and honest about that. Because uh, he's, the, if, there's, if you Google, I'm not sure entirely what to Google, but there's the epic photo of him ejecting um, out of his Harrier in Afghanistan um, as he's, um, well, let's just say things have gone wrong, not his way, and he's had to eject pretty much on, on landing as um, he's had fire licking around him, um, you know, flames, and to the point where it's just like, right, I better get out, and boof, he ejects. So, and you, this, for whatever reason, there was someone, I think a spotter, taking photographs of it, and they've caught the moment with like the cones of the fire coming out of the bottom of the ejection seat. It's, it's an epic photo. But anyway, I hope that helps, uh, Tom. I, I wish you all the best of luck. Just really enjoy it, though. That's the main thing. Um, you've, you've got to. Like some of the friends I made on IoT, um, and you know, still in touch with them today, um, because you just, you, that camaraderie is something else. And um, yeah, enjoy it. And all the best. Um, does the Typhoon have anything else than Link 16? Uh, so I, I'm guessing you mean when it comes to the, um, what's it's also known as MIDS, so the Multifunctional Information Distribution System. Um, no, that's it. It wouldn't need anything else. Um, but then if you, I guess if you want to talk specifics, you've got things like the secure radios, as you can imagine. Um, but when it when we're talking about the flow of information, no, it's it's just that. Uh, let's see. They're using older phone servers. Put that in sort of like that's that's what enemy planes they were fighting against. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And and that's actually what they're using at Red Flag. Yeah. And I think it's um it's awesome what they're doing. I exercise Red Flag. Uh, you know, I'll never forget some of the the pictures um, that I have seen. You know, um, or, or sorry, how to explain some of the things that I saw on my radar. We just got so many different uh, contacts. So you know, we're tr used to training over the North Sea with like uh, all the typhoons or lots of typhoons launching from Coningsby and then lots of typhoons from Lossiemouth, and then we'll have a big fight in, in the middle. Um, so you've got a fair few contacts on, on, on your radar scope there and your V-scope. And then you go out to Red Flag and it's just like, whoa, I, I, there's so many contacts that I, I do not know what's going on. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, um, it definitely turns up the heat when you go to a Red Flag. Um, and, yeah, when it comes to, oh, sorry, I'll just flick down again. I'm going to have to start rattling through here, aren't I? Lots of questions. Yeah, the different modes of the ESA. Well, uh, to be honest, that is something that is, as you can imagine, constantly evolving. And um, so I, I don't know when that's going to be available. Although I'm, you know, fairly close to things like that at the moment. But it's, um, yeah, the, the, it's not the kind of uh, thing I would be able to state. But um, but I honestly don't know when it will be available. Uh, and Mike, if you're happy, shall I just um, keep on trying to to get through these questions? Yeah, I was just gonna say yeah because we got some great ones, you know, for, uh, you know, um, at the bottom, just further down. So we might want to flick through, but maybe if you want to lift, uh, like, uh, answer maybe two, uh, three, or four, if that you're happy with doing that. Yeah, I'm happy. Absolutely, no worries at all. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I'll try and. I'll try and cherry pick. And, and again, sorry of not being able to answer all your questions. Uh, you know, thank you so much for for tuning in. I'll uh, I'll keep going. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, Mark Stewart, I like this question. Is flying typhoon more to do with managing systems and computers rather than hands on stick? Um, as in, you know, compared to proper raw flying, you're absolutely spot on. And um, the the typhoon is is all to do with the information management. You know, where you're looking, when you're looking, because you've got the three um, MF sorry MXDDs, so the three screens in the cockpit. You've got the HUD. You've got the um, you, the projected information onto your visor. So trying to take all this information, and absorb what's going on, that is the big thing. So, and, and that's actually just information. Never mind, you know, the fact that you will be 
in charge of an AOR, air of responsibility, or you know, a bit of airspace that is like 100 miles long and 80 miles wide, and you in charge of your formation. Um, so actually, the, the flying the Typhoon is frankly very easy, and it's been designed like that so that you can um, concentrate uh, on, on all this information and, and the battle space, or the fact that you're dropping a weapon on a moving target. Um, so yeah, good question. Uh, Bill, the DFC um, Distinguished Flying Cross was from a mission in Shader back in 2016, um, May 2016. And um, to be honest, to keep it short, it was just a, a very, very busy day in the office. You know, like we, we tend to try and train hard and fight easy. You know, so when we go into Op Shader, then everything we're, we're faced with is, um, is going to be easier than what we've trained to. But I tell you, this day was just crazy. There was just multiple targets and we were having to flow you know straight from one target onto the next one onto the next one and i just had to make a few um a few decisions uh, especially when it came to fuel and because we were being told that there was people who were effectively about to die um and they were taking casualties and and we were the only asset there that was close and able to help them because it was just absolutely mobbed in the the area the AOR and um, so you know I am um, I actually when I came back I used to keep a mission diary of almost every mission I flew in and, and the last line was that was that was the most rewarding thing I've ever done in the Air Force was to save the lives of Allied troops uh, you know I, I wrote that as a last line just for me um, or I shared it with my dad as well but you know that was what I said so to then you know be awarded a DSC was um, was you know a, a, an amazing thing and but at the same time I honestly believe it's part of the team you know like I was there did the job but the only reason I didn't mess up was because I had all the team the air terror refueling the Voyager had to come closer to me so I didn't have to go too far and therefore lose fuel the, 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 the stress was mine trying to deal with all this incoming information and get us to do to, to drop the weapons and then our weapons dudded um, as in the, the weapon didn't explode so we had to re-attack and yeah it was um, and the engineers you know everyone forgets about the engineers but i remember it was a really stressful day just to get the aircraft actually off the ground and they they went you know sweating because it was so hot there they really did go the extra mile just to even get us airborne so it was just one of those days in the office um i tell you what i will Pick a, a last question. Here we go. Uh, Dave Smith, um, how punishing is it to dogfight in a plane with so much sustained energy? Does does that up the physical requirements for prospective pilots? Hey, that's a, that's a good question, and I can tell you it is hard work because that thing, the, the typhoon, um, as you break into uh, dogfight, as in you merge, you break in, and you're instantly pulling 9G. Because, of, like we were talking about just previously, about how easy it is to fly, that means that because you're relying on the avionics to limit your G force, so you can only pull up to, to 9G, um, then therefore you're just looking at the target that you're merging with and you're just rolling and pulling. And you're not caring about anything because you know the aircraft will give you, but that you're absolutely just stuck into the chair. Um, and then you just start instantly pouring with sweat, to be honest, because your body's working against the G4 force. And and then depending on, on how high you are, you know, actually the higher you are, then you're not going to get so much uh, G or it's not going to be sustained for so long because of the um, the air density is, is less the further further up you are. So actually you're going to lose energy quicker. So, but if you're like fighting from like say 10,000 feet down to 5,000 feet or down to sea level, then yeah, you're going to be just pulling that 9G constantly. So, so yeah, it's um, it's 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 a complete beast to be honest. And and it's when I really do look at this as um, when I look at UAVs and what technology there is out there, you can see that now actually it's the human body that is going to be the limiting or is already the limiting factor on these fast jet platforms.
and it always will be now obviously it gets a bit more complicated because it's not just to do with how well the aircraft turns or performs you know for a dogfight actually it's all going to be beyond visual range warfare or certainly you know maybe day one war will be dogfight but then everything after that will be beyond visual range with electronic attack and ew so um so yeah i hope that um answers your question uh, and sorry uh, the second part of your question does it up the physical requirements for prospective pilots and um I don't, I don't think it will, because actually the bar it has been quite high anyway, but not so much just for, uh, for being a pilot, because that's not really separate. It's the same fitness testing that you've got to go to. But, but I do think actually on your, your question, it's really important that, um, that pilots, that they, they continue to get the training that they require to build up their neck strength, for example. You know, that was something that we got introduced to and we started uh, working on. I mean. Like my neck has definitely grown in size since flying the flying the typhoon. Um, you know, never mind doing strength neck strengthening exercises. So, um, again, hopefully that answers your question. And um, Mike, I'm, I'm happy to continue, um, but I will, if you're happy, I will go for another question. Problem, Rog, go for it. Um, here we go. Hmm. Um, okay, I tell you what, the, I quite like um, uh, this one where it's the the hypothetical question. If the RAF was to replace the typhoon tomorrow, and you were tasked to choose its replacement, what jet would you pick and why? <laughs> that's a it's a good um, it's a good question, and I'll tread carefully, but. Um, I, th I think if I was to, to look at it, because it, you know what I was saying before, like all the different aircraft have different strengths and weaknesses. So the Typhoon is a beast. So it depends what, as in, so think of it as a, as a, as a raw dogfighter with so much power uh, and actually a good radar, especially when we're you know thinking about ESA and, and what's to come as well in the future. But with the sensors, it's never going to be a fifth gen platform because it, it's it's not going to have that those sensors available. Um, you know, it's not been designed that way. So therefore, you definitely want something um, to replace the Typhoon stepping up into fifth gen. Um, and and you know, we've already got the F thirty five, and and that is epic. But I've just, I've got to say, F twenty two. I just I love the look of the Raptor. And I do have some mates who have flown it, and we we do get a bit of an insight into some of the um, you know the abilities that it has as well. And and having flown with it and worked with it quite closely, you know, together working as a team, like that story I mentioned before, or maybe even here, um, you know, working together on exercise red flag, that was you know an amazing experience. And and actually, you start to appreciate the. The pure performance, you know, in, in, with the sensors and everything. But then I'm sure you've heard that actually a lot of people. Are, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm still gonna sit in the fence with this one. But you know, a lot of people say that the typhoon would beat the F-22 in a dogfight. But then, so that this is where I take it to a case of like, well, what we're talking about here is a, you know, what performance um, are we are we are we honing into and what capability. Um, so actually, the way we've got it, in my opinion, in the Air Force, with the Typhoon working together with the F-35, 4.5 gen with 5th gen interoperability, working together as a team and bringing different um, skills and uh, advantages um, to the, you know, to the battle space and working together, then it's a, it's a pretty awesome fighting force. And that's why we as the Air Force have stuck to it. So. And um, hopefully that answers your questions. Right, so Rog, I'm going to let you pick one yeah. more question to wrap up this absolutely brilliant Q&A. So you pick one to wrap up, that'll be perfect. No worries at all, pleasure. Right, here we go. I'll get looking down the list. And again, thank you so much, everybody, for, for all the questions. It's uh, fantastic. Um, I do, do, do a quick uh, shout out to the, the Royal Bear Force. Um, I'm, I'm so um, proud to be an ambassador for the Royal Bear Force and everything that's, that's happening 
there. And uh, like I said to you, I think that my my son, or both of my sons, but especially Henry, he's, he's a bit older, he absolutely loves uh, the book. And it's, it's like a favorite for an entire like two weeks, which to tell you what, is, is saying something for my kids. So um, so yeah, more than more than happy, and um, more proud to be an ambassador. Um, and I think I will. Um, who's going on? No, I tell you what, I've kind of already answered that. Oh, here we go, Chris. First aid is a mandatory training requirement in some parts of the RAF family. Do you believe, with your mental health involvement, that MOD will ever make? Mental health first aid, a, man, a mandatory requirement. That is a fantastic question, and I am, um, I'm so glad that someone has has brought this, um, you know, mental health uh, question, an important topic, uh, to the fore. Um, and I'm glad I spotted your question. So, in in short, absolutely, um, I or absolutely, I I think that it should. So, as a mental health first aider myself, so if um. If you didn't catch the beginning of this, I'm, um, I'm actually an investor for um, headfit.org. So please, everyone who's listening in, definitely check it out, uh, headfit.org. It is designed for defense personnel, but you know, I take it from being on this, in this call that you, uh, um, you, know, you have a passion for aviation. And, and actually, when you look into this, I mean, it's more military-esque rather than, um, than aviation, but there's lots of like really cool an interesting, insightful mental health techniques or, or focusing on how to get, um, how to better your mental fitness or how to stay on top of it. Because I think that is so important. And you know, for a lot of people I've, I've, um, who have asked the questions today, uh, and my answer have been hungry to learn and that. But remember to branch that across into your mental fitness and think if I want to be the best version of myself, I've actually got to practice these things to be able to be the best version of myself so that I can be hungry to learn. So therefore, you know, have a look into this, into these mental um, fitness skills and tools, you know, how the different ways that you can actually uh, better yourself. Um, I'm really, you know, hungry about that. But I'm also um, an RAF uh, ambassador for mental health and well-being. And, and with that, I managed to luckily get on. Of course, I go to, and uh, so my first mental health first aider. And tell you what, an absolutely awesome course uh, spanned over. Uh, I think it was five days in the end, five day course, and just so interesting to learn about the ins and outs. You know, stuff that I've known to a level because of um, you know losing someone in my close family to suicide, and, and why I'm so passionate about mental health campaigning, and, and why I'm so passionate about this. Um, and, and actually, we have already out here in my organization out here have, have got a really high majority um, trained up in mental health first aid. And there is chat about it becoming a mandatory requirement. And, you know, maybe we should start the rumor here. Maybe we just say that it is becoming a mandatory requirement. And then there we go, we'll plant the seeds and uh, that will become, um, it'll become the, the future. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question because you're right. And, and as I've said so many times, when you compare uh, physical health to, to mental health, it's got to be given the same emphasis. You know, we have fitness tests and we have uh, different ways of, of ensuring that we're staying on top of our, our fitness um, when it comes to physical fitness. So actually in mental fitness, okay, you maybe don't want to go testing people on the mental fitness, but actually we want to be giving people the tool set so that you can stay on top of it and and um and and yeah just be the best version of themselves because that's i think is so important where we're given the tool sets for that so thanks again for your great question and thanks everybody uh, for your wonderful questions and sorry i couldn't uh, answer them all thanks again well rog thank you very much for coming on the the show for this q a it's been absolutely incredible and yeah thank you to uh, to all the folks who've joined us tonight for the great questions and what i'm going to do is well rog i'm going to link um rogers uh, just giving uh, uh link in the description below we can hopefully get him to his thousand pounds target for his titanium man in estonia and i will link rogers um also his social media so go and give him a follow and support his great campaign but roger thank you very much it's been brilliant
Hey, thanks very much, Mike, for that. And um, and honestly, you know, I, I'm more about um, sharing the awareness and and you know, getting the um, getting the information out there about mental health. And and thank you so much as well for putting my book on the on the sort of background there. This be a sound sound of mind. We've we've actually raised close to twenty six thousand pounds now for for mental health charities. And, and currently, as you just said, for for mind through that um, through that link, which is just giving. And then I think it's fundraising Scottish Titanium Man. So if you, if you search for Scottish Titanium Man, then you'll get it. But the link will be in the description. Thanks, Mike. And um, yeah, and it's just, you know, it's so heartwarming to have people's support. And it'll give me the oomph. I'm definitely going to need an Ironman Estonia on the 7th of August. Um, but like I said, and also if you, um, if you choose to donate, if you donate, uh, um, I think I've said at least 15 pounds, then I'll send you a, a book as well uh, in the post. So, um, uh, and also I'm going to actually be starting hot off the press. I'm going to start a roulette, and there's going to be a 50 quid uh, wiggle voucher for anybody who manages or guesses closest to my finishing time. <laughs> so I'll be wow. releasing as well, which has given me even more accountability. But, um, but Mike, thanks again, and thanks again everyone for tuning in. And it's always um, it's always great to chat to you, Mike, and I, I truly appreciate your support as well, right from. Well, it's been years now, hasn't it, since we first met, so thank you. Absolutely. I'm uh, all behind you for this uh, Iron Man, Rog. So, yeah, links in the description, guys. But, uh, yeah, again, Rog, cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Thanks all.